Good evening and welcome to the Digital Bible Study here at Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Chuck and today we're going to be continuing our study in the book of 1 Peter. Uh, as you can see by my t-shirt, we're in the middle of vacation Bible school week here at Calvary and so we've been having a great time with the kids all week long. Uh, God's doing lots of great things and so a um, little tired at the moment as we are winding into the week uh, but we are still going to have a wonderful time looking at God's Word here tonight. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 of First Peter chapter 2. And so uh, let's jump right into the text. And we see here that it says, starting in verse 1, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And so... Peter, as he writes this text to, or yeah, Peter, as he writes this text to the churches that are in this area, he is telling them that they need to put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. And if you think about it, that is a description of how the world acts. I mean, the world is malicious, seeking only its own gain and its own interests. The world is deceitful. Uh, Without the moral code and without the moral compass that God gives us, lying really isn't a big deal, and being deceitful isn't a big deal. In fact, we've had many instances where we see people within the church be deceitful and be purposely misleading with the flock, and it's horrible when that happens. You know, you see that all over the place in church, and Peter here says, don't do it. Put away all deceit and hypocrisy. You know, hypocrisy is one of those words that gets thrown around in the church, but let's remember for a second what hypocrisy really means and what hypocrisy really is. Hypocrisy comes from the word that, that actors would use as they would put a mask over their face when they would do and perform Greek plays. That's where the word kind of comes from. This idea of being a hypocrite is to be a pretender, someone who's faking something, someone who is presenting themselves as something other than they, what they are. And so to be a hypocrite is to go out and put on the perfect appearance while inside you're an absolute mess. Or to go in and condemn other people and tell other people how they need to live when you yourself aren't living according to your own advice. And so he says that's not supposed to be any part of the church. And of course, envy. We shouldn't look at one another envying what we have. We shouldn't look at each other and desire what others have more than what God has given us. We should be content in what we have in the Lord. The world is envious. Uh, you look at businesses, they constantly want more profit, they want more growth, they want more market share. You look at people inside different institutions in our country, there's constant bickering and fighting and arguing. There's an envious relationship that's there. And then, of course, slander, speaking falsehood against someone else. And, and it's really funny how you get such a picture of what the world is in this sentence. And we in the church are told to put away all those things, to put away all those things. How are we going to do that? How are we going to accomplish that great task? Because I don't know about you, but it's hard to put away malice and deceit. It's hard to put away hypocrisy and envy and slander. It's difficult not to engage in these things, especially in the world we live in that engages in them so easily. So what are we supposed to do? How do we come to a point where we're not going to engage in those kind of behavior? Well, in verse 2, Peter says, Like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So he says, like a newborn, you need to long for pure spiritual milk. This is one place where I, I really feel like the ESV translation falls short because it leaves out a very important component. You know, like newborn infants long for spiritual milk, that spiritual milk is the word. And in fact, if you look at the New American Standard, if you look at the Christian Standard Bible, if you look at the King James Bible, they all say long for that pure spiritual milk of the word, and they leave that intact. We need to understand what it is that Peter is calling the church to do. Like a newborn infant, we should long for the word of God. We should long for scripture. We should meditate on scripture. I don't know if you've ever been in the house with a newborn infant, but you know we've had four kids. And as those kids, we bring them home from the hospital, here are these beautiful newborn little babies. And every single night, 
about three o'clock in the morning, they start to cry and scream, and they will not stop until they've had their milk. That's the picture that Scripture is giving us. It's a desire that is so strong that we're going to pitch a fit unless we get it. That's how we should long for the Word. You know, we should wake up in the morning and we should not be satisfied until we have opened the Bible and consumed our spiritual nourishment for that day. We should long for it periodically throughout the day. I don't know if you know this or not, but infants don't eat one time a day. Infants eat several times throughout the day. Every few hours, there they are, eating more of the word of eating more of that milk. And that's how we should be with the Word of God. Don't limit yourself to a 15-minute devotional when your soul is craving more. And, and that can be accomplished in lots of different ways practically. You could have a time of reading in the morning where you are just reading through large chunks of Scripture. You could have another time during the day where you're meditating and thinking on a small passage of Scripture. You could have another time a day when you are memorizing Scripture and working on retaining that information so that you can meditate on it later. And then you could have another time throughout your week sometime where you're actually doing study of the Bible opening up the Bible, taking some notes, writing down some questions, researching the answers to those questions. That's how a newborn craves milk. They craze it, crave it intensely and periodically throughout the day. So should we. You know, we, we should long for the Word of God, and that's going to have an effect in our lives if we do that. If you were to wake up in the morning and read the Bible, and then later memorize the Bible, and then later meditate on the Bible, and then later study the Bible, and do all of those things every day, it would have a profound effect in you, because look what he continues to say in verse 2. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Okay? Just imagine that picture. We're talking about this idea of growing up into salvation. It's almost like growing into a coat that doesn't fit you yet. Uh, Our kids get hand-me-down clothes a lot. And, you know, they put on maybe a shirt or a pair of shoes for the first time, and they don't quite fit. Sleeves are a little long. Pants are a little big. Shoes are a little big. But what do we always tell our kids? You're going to grow into it. Okay, that's the picture that Peter's giving here. We're supposed to grow into a salvation. Here's the important thing. The salvation is yours. The salvation belongs to you. It was purchased by Christ on the cross. You don't have to earn it. It doesn't say grow up for your salvation. It says grow up into your salvation. You're growing into a salvation that is yours, given to you freely by Christ Jesus. But you have to grow up into it. What does that mean? Your life has to be shaped and molded by putting away malice, putting away deceit, putting away hypocrisy, putting away envy, putting away slander getting rid of those things that look like the world, and instead serving and living for God. And you grow up into that. And and this is a process in our lives. We grow up into that salvation. You know, my kids don't go to sleep one one night and, and their shoes don't fit, and all of a sudden they wake up the next morning and, boom, it's a perfect fit. Look at that. Same thing's true with our spiritual development. It is a process. Day after day after day, you crave the spiritual nourishment of the Word. You spend time in the Word. You read the Word, the study your Word. You memorize the Word. You interact with the Word again and again and again and again and again and again. And slowly over time, you are growing up into that salvation. You are growing up being more fit for that salvation. You are growing up looking more like Jesus who provides you that salvation. And yet, we don't do this with our spiritual development at all. We fall short in so many different ways. Um, Let me ask you this. Which would you rather do? Would you rather eat a few meals throughout the day? Or would you rather eat one giant meal on Monday and not eat again until Thursday? Or better yet, would you rather have a huge meal on Sunday morning and you just gorge yourself and fill yourself and then you don't eat anything until a week later? And yet that's how many of us treat our spiritual lives. We show up on Sunday, we listen to the word, we praise God, we pray in church, we have this wonderful time of fellowship, we fill and stuff our faces spiritually, and then we starve ourselves all week because we won't go and spend time with God the way he calls us to. And and those who do a good job, those who do a good job, They'll go and they'll have maybe a small meal in the morning and then they will starve themselves for the rest of the day. Can I tell you something? If you want to grow in your faith, get the idea of a single morning devotional out of your head. 
get out of your head. In, in the book of Joshua, when God was commissioning Joshua to lead the armies of Israel, he said, uh, this word of the law shall not depart from your mouth. And this is what it means by that. It's an old Jewish idiom. And it's not saying that he should never speak the word of God, because that's not what it should be. What it means is, is that you should be holding God's word in your mouth all the time, so that when you open it, it falls out. That's what it says. This word of the law shall not depart from your mouth. It's like if you take a big old gulp of water and then you try to talk, the water falls out of your mouth. That's what God was telling Joshua. And that's how we should be. The word of the Lord should never depart from our mouth. We should wake up in the morning, read it, and then constantly refer back to what we read over and over again, mulling over it, memorizing it, trying to understand it, trying to apply it, seeing all the implications that exist from that word. And as we do that, we're going to grow in our faith. But I believe that we have millions and millions of immature Christians in this world because they haven't desired the true spiritual milk of the word. Not the way an infant does. Not continually throughout the day that they're supposed to. Get the idea of a single daily devotional out of your mind. If you think that you're going to sit up in the morning and you're going to read for 10 minutes and then go about your merry day and that's your only interaction with the Bible and you're really going to grow the way God wants you to grow, it's not going to happen. You need to be reading the Word, memorizing the Word, meditating on the Word, studying the Word daily. You might carve out some larger times a few times a week for study, but you should definitely be reading, meditating, and memorizing every single day. Make that your three stops throughout the day and crave the spiritual milk that way. Because something happens as we grow up into this salvation. It's for a purpose. Because God's doing something with us as we are brought to salvation. Because look what he says in verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we are coming to him, the living stone rejected by men, that is Jesus. But in the sight of God, he is chosen and precious. And just like him, the stone that the builders rejected, as we come to salvation, we ourselves are like living stones being built up into a spiritual house. We collectively as Christians are forming the temple of God. What happened at the temple of God? Man came in contact with the Almighty. That's what took place. We are being built up as a spiritual house for God. That is the temple. For what purpose? To be a holy priesthood. What did the priesthood do? The priest brought sacrifices to the temple. That was their function and job. They brought the sacrifices. And so we too are to bring sacrifices, but our sacrifices are not bulls and goats and the blood of animals. Our sacrifices are spiritual. We bring praise. We bring adoration. We bring devotion. We bring love. We bring these things to God. And can I tell you something? You will never fulfill your spiritual obligation as a priest in God's temple if you are not continually being fed by the milk of the word. That's why this th these two ideas are right here next to each other. There's a progression to it. We're putting away malice and becoming more like Christ. We're able to do that because we're being strengthened by the word of God and grown into the word of God, growing up into this salvation that's been given to us. And as that happens, we offer praise, adoration, and thanksgiving to God, giving him the spiritual sacrifices that he so deserves. All these things work together in harmony. So let me ask you a question. Are you fulfilling your role as a priest in God's temple? is we collectively, the church, come together to offer a sacrifice of praise, thanksgiving, honor, adoration, as we bring these spiritual sacrifices made acceptable in Christ. Are you fulfilling that role? Do you bring him praise? Do you bring him true devotion, sacrificing all else to follow him? And ask yourself, if the answer is no, ask yourself the question, why? Could it be that you're not spending time in God's word the way you should? Do you crave God's word? Do you long for it the way a newborn infant longs for milk? Are you so agitated that when you don't have God's word that you just can't help but go do something about it? Do you cry, fuss, kick, and scream until you've been satisfied by the word of God? Or do you view God's word as an obligation, a burden, or a duty? Can I tell you something? Drinking milk is not an obligation to an infant. It is a joy and a need. And we need to view the word of God that way. 
God's word is our greatest joy. God's word is one of our greatest needs. We should long to spend time just leafing through the pages of scripture, taking in his truth, taking in his precepts. And, and that's what we need to do. So I challenge you today, if, if you don't long for the Bible that way, pray to God and confess that for the sin that it is. Go to God and say, God, I'm sorry that I don't, I don't crave your word this way. I'm sorry that I don't have that strong of a desire for your word, but give it to me. Ask him to put that desire in your heart. And then in faith, open up your Bible and read the word, even though that desire is not there. Because this is another place I think we miss out a lot. We sit there and we pray, God, give me the desire to read your word. And then we sit back and we wait and think, well, if he gives me the desire, I'll read it. That's not what we're supposed to do. You confess the wickedness of your heart and the fact that you don't desire his word. And then in faith, knowing that he will answer your prayer, you read the word of God. And as you read the word of God, he will develop that desire in your heart. That's how it works. And so I challenge you today, go spend some time with God. Beg and plead for that desire to be granted to you. And then step out in faith and read his word the way an infant desires milk. Read his word with passion. Read his word as though it is a desire of your soul. And don't just do it once a day, but come back to God's word multiple times throughout your day. Doesn't have to be for hours and hours on end, but read something. And then throughout the day, meditate on it and think about it again and again and again. Don't just read it and put away and get on to better things. Read it and carry it with you all day. Memorize it and carry it around with you forever. And if we'll do those things the way scripture says, we will see that we're able to put off the sinful habits of this world and we will look more like Jesus. And what a wonderful thing that is. Hope you've enjoyed looking at the scripture with me this evening. Hope you have a great rest of your day, and God bless.